Um, I'm only going to disappoint you today after John's introduction, so thank you. I appreciate that, brother. Um, anyway, I have a lot of things we can cover today, obviously. Um, there's an array of stuff. I'm going to throw you my best stuff to actually make you think. All right? Look, I look at each workout as a biological experiment. So I've coached 20 years, and I, I oversaw the training of 12 different teams for about 12 years. I wrote 27 programs a month for Division I athletes and maybe more for professionals. And each one of those were a biological experiment to me. So my perspective is just a lot of experience. I, I use this formula to solve and create questions. I ask questions. I question myself more than anybody ever has which creates problems I didn't know I had, and then I just make solutions, okay? And you'll see everything I'm explaining to you today, how that came about. Um, I'm gonna briefly, quickly cover triphasic training, maybe. It's about a 380-page book. I'll cover it in two minutes, how's that? So you don't have to buy it if you haven't had it yet, all right? Pretty simple. Uh, well, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. But, but let's be honest, with, uh, when I started looking at movements, Years ago, I was like, why can't this guy reverse the bar weight as much as him? And maybe this guy's max is four, they're both 400 pounds, but when they go to squat, they can't reverse as fast. One reverses and it's nice and slow. One reverses and it's much faster, but their max is the same. And, and what I began to look at is the amount of um, force that these athletes are able to produce. And this being force, this is, this is the time at which you're gonna produce force. And basically what I found was the, every movement is a triphasic action. So the first part of the movement, if I can, if I'll split the, split, this is the middle of the, the bottom of the squat, let's say, you're lowering the weight so you're producing less force and then you produce force in a certain parameter of time. We know that's power. This is power athlete, right? Hopefully you guys know what power is. Um, now, the key to this is, I had two athletes that were the same strength, and guess what? They were the same strength, I think they benched around 440. One threw the, the shot put 55 feet, and one threw it 65 feet. And when I analyzed these athletes, this V right here, and the 65 footer was shorter. So everybody goes, oh, he throws farther because he can produce more force in a faster time, which makes sense. But after experiment after experiment, and look, I'm not that smart, okay? So the first person to look at this graph would have said, oh, there's something here. It took me hundreds and maybe hundreds of reps and tests to go, oh, this is why it goes more. I gotta keep producing more force. But here's what happened. There was a correlation between here and here. So your ability to absorb force and withstand force was the key factor. You'll, you'll never see in a dynamic movement somebody come in super slow and then go fast unless it's planned. So your ability to stop and handle the bench press or the squat at the bottom dictates how hard and fast you can move it. So nobody really trained it with precision or with specific stress. So this is the eccentric phase. The middle here is basically the isophase, and this is the concentric phase of triphasic training. So what I do, the best way to train something is to train it in a block. If you have a quality, you train it for two straight weeks to three. Why? You're taking the organism and putting very specific stress on it, okay? And when I say that, if you have a organism that's trying to adapt to something, you have a triathlon here and a powerlifting meet here, and you ask that person to train for both. How's that gonna go? It's gonna go shit. If you don't know that, like it's not gonna go well. You're not gonna get optimal results. You might get better at everything, but you're gonna get marginal gains. So, but if you ask them to train for this mark right here, whatever it is, maybe it's strength, and you teach that organism, because here's the thing with adaption. You're gonna pull it, you're gonna pull it in this direction a little bit, you're gonna pull it in this direction a little bit, but if you, if you focus on one spot, 
the adaptations are much greater. And then you just keep building on those. So whatever quality you want, you can actually teach the organism to be higher functioning. Okay? I'll get into deep adaptation. I'll, I'll throw something out there. If this is eccentric, here's the deal. If I focus two weeks on eccentric, everything in the body, the hormones, the organs, the brain, adapts to eccentric training. If I'm not doing much else. So if my whole program's eccentric, what you do is you take that organism so deep in that, that adaptation, and you may lose it later, but you've taken it so deep that it has a tolerance and a resistance towards stressors of what it adapted to during the eccentric phase that you'll never ever get there if you don't focus on three weeks or two weeks of complete eccentrics. Does that make sense? So what is, e what is triphasic? It's basically one to two weeks or uh, two weeks of eccentrics, two more weeks of isos, weeks uh, let's say three and four, and then weeks five and six is the concentric part. Now, you can put download weeks in there. They don't have to be done together. They can be done apart. But, and it's, it's mainly an off-season training program, okay? It's, it's, it's not fun. It's ugly, okay? And, and the reason triphasic, I've sold 60,000 books, is that it's not a program. It's a concept you put in your current program and any exercise you want. That's, that's it. And I know a lot of geniuses out there have said, hey, I, yeah, I've done eccentrics, I've done isos, but I actually put it into a system. That's all I did, okay? And I did the same thing, okay? The benefits of it, basically what you're doing with eccentrics is you're remodeling tissue. At the cellular level, you're pulling tissue apart. The immune system goes up, causes white, uh, white blood cell reaction. Sounds horrible, okay, but that's training, all right? <laughs> you create the tissue, make it stronger, It'll rebuild itself, okay? So for two weeks, you're rebuilding tissue. Now, I have, a whole, I have multiple books laid out, but you could take supplements also during that time that help recover you from eccentrics. You can take a lot of things, okay? The next two weeks, you got brand new tissue. The immune system's remodeled it. The actin and myosin head, in the muscle, when it twitches, there's actin and myosin, these heads. What, what the eccentric phase does is it breaks these. The immune system comes in, white blood cell response, rebuilds them, and it makes them thicker. So, by making these heads thicker, you're re less resistant to injury. And then what I do is the isometric phase, it's the fastest way to get strong, period, end of story, isometrics. You do the isometrics in the stretch position with the new tissue that you've just created and you can decrease your ability to get injured, soft tissues. I, you can't believe the amount of coaches that have emailed me and say, hey, we reduced our soft tissue. You didn't do my program, you just put specific stress into yours and that was it, okay? And then once you create that tissue stronger, now here's where the beauty of transfer to, to sport is, is when you go down with 400 pounds and you stop it, all these, all these qualities, the new tissue, and now that's stronger, can reverse it. Because you have to realize the muscle, if this is your muscle, and this is the tendon, the bad representation, that's the most important, this muscle tendon junction is key for everything. You got it? You could move without it. Now, its interaction is important. This is basically a two-spring system. You have to strengthen both of these at the same time. So what triphasic does is strengthens, rebuilds the tissue of the muscles. The isos will also affect the tendon a little bit. And then you go into your power phases, which will affect the tendon a little bit more. And then plyometrics will affect the tendon. Okay? But this, these two things together will make this a much stronger tissue, and then you can absorb more force. So my elite athletes got to a point where they would take four, 500, 600 pounds, stop it, and, and do you guys know when the, the barbell hits the ground, you can hear that ting when you drop it? That's what it would sound like when they brought the bar down, most advanced athletes. So I'm telling you, there was that ping with the plates hitting the bar when they went to stop it as they were squatting and benching. That's how violent it was. 
And I knew I had something there. And that particular kid was 6'5", 270, had a 44-inch vertical, okay? Yeah, he was a world-class shot putter. Um, but my point is, is that, so well, really quick on this, power lifters, they, they train a lot of strength, but they don't train plyos, they don't train speed, they, they don't train at light loads. So you're training the muscle the whole time, what do they do? They tear their muscles. And then you see all these combine guys, football guys, go to these combine places, and what do they do? They train speed, plyos, just to get ready for 40, right? So they train the tendon more. What, do you, what happens? They pull their muscles when they run. This is the system. So triphasic, the foundational stuff for this is that there's a system here that takes you through a process, okay, of training. So you train heavy weights, and then you get to the the high speed stuff and more power training, and that's the process you have to go through because training is a process. And all these athletes nowadays want instant results, and I can get some instant results, but it's not gonna lay the foundation for your tissues to be trained correctly. And then what happens, look, if this muscle becomes strong, the tendon, there's certain interaction. I'm telling you right now, trust me when I say this, that if you get the interaction correct, specific when you run here's the beauty when you run and this muscle can stretch the tendon more you get a return of free energy so for example uh, a world-class uh, when I say this a world-class um, study supposedly in the Soviet Union I had it at one point I, I haven't found it but it was uh, 5,000 meter runners the difference was between the most the best in the world at 5,000 meters was that at 3,000 meters, the best guys in the world in the second level, what happened? When they ran, they started undulating their hips. They couldn't find VO2 max strength. There was nothing that indicated there was a difference between the best in the world and, and the, the ones that were just missed the metal stand. Except at 3,000 meters, their hips started to undulate more. What was that? That was their strength levels. When the foot struck the ground, couldn't support the forces, so their hips sagged, and then what propelled them forward? The muscle increased its work capacity at 3,000 meters to push them forward. This is why they were slower, because they're more metabolic. The other guy's hip never undulated, so when he struck the ground, where did he get his energy from? His tendon. It's free energy, people. It's free energy. So this is why he ran farther. His VO2 max may have been less. But this interaction is so important for every movement in sports, whether you're throwing a baseball, whether you're running, any movement that involves a muscle and a tendon, triphasic is important for is all I'm saying. Okay? Now, the beauty of this is, so when you do triphasic, you make those tissues more effective. People say, oh, they got in shape. Well, they may not have gotten shape, but they're more economically sound, so they don't have to expend as much energy. That's the beauty of it, okay? I went a little long on triphasic. Um, like I said, I've seen this work. I have thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of testing, force plates, everything, to, to make sure that this works. Everything I'm gonna show you today, I've tested. I'll get hate email, for, hate email from across the world on stuff I'm gonna talk to you about today. But are there any questions on triphasic before we get going? Hopefully you guys have a, a sound understanding. Yes, sir. Maybe dumb, but so it can't fully prevent an injury, so when an injury does happen, is it more significant it's, to recover from? It's less than, I think the injury is um, less because you have stronger tissue. Okay. And then I think you'll recover faster. Okay. Yeah. But that's the number one goal is, because look, if this person can't do anything, then he's useless to me. Sounds horrible, but as a, as a strength coach, they're useless to me. So they can't play. I get fired. Uh, we're in trouble. I'm in trouble anyway. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I do. So yeah, okay, I'm above 80%. So theoretically, if you go down on the eccentric face for six seconds, you don't have enough muster to get up, maybe on your first rep, but not your second. So then we help our athletes up. And people have come to my gym, said, oh, these athletes, he does so much weight, they can't even lift the bar. Right? He's an idiot. And, and they didn't know before even the book came out, people come to my gym. Oh, Cal doesn't know what he's doing. He has athletes doing weight that they can't even lift, that people have to help up every rep. Well, that's what, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> right? So, like, and, and I don't care if people rip on me. I, it, it doesn't matter. You just don't even know what I'm talking about, right? And not that I, and, and I may be crazy, that's fine, but I get, some, I, I get results. So, long story short, so yeah, it's an, you might be able to do a hex dead level. I've seen people do a double leg hex dead and then split stance on the way down to get that eccentric focus. I've seen double leg, you know, so it, there may be something you can modify. John, what else do you do? Uh, there's, hit me on that, like, uh, so what I did is, uh, I did Cal's program, Cal's program. So I, I went great, I read the book, and I said, what a program, and then I did that, and I do it. And uh, then I wrote the version of the program, and tested the private lines, so that I could figure out how I could run it in a, because you know, Cal, And we tested it. Uh, I brought it on, uh, offline with a bunch of private clients and have some really cool ways of kind of tweaking it. But the idea is, and this is where we talked about the idea of big, so big complex uh, um, principles to this. I mean, he's looking at training different muscle contractions almost separately, but it's, it's kind of, uh, that's not the whole piece to it. I mean, there's French contrast, there's the idea of plyometrics, the lightning method, there's a few different pieces. So we just have to uh, kind of assemble it in such a way that you can do it. But you also have to be strong enough, like the kid can't squat the fucking bar. Right, right. How are we going to figure out what his 80% is? Everything can squat. Right. So there is uh, a certain, and the way I look at it, it's like there's a progression. we got to teach people to lift weights first. Yeah. And like, you know, just like anything. So like I said, we got to teach them how to lift weights. we got to teach them what movement is. And what Cal's really showing is, uh, you know, he's working with some high-level athletes. Uh, does it work for everybody? Yeah, because he's focusing on muscle contractions, which everybody has. Everybody has. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, but uh, you know, I remember the first time when we went to dinner, we were laughing, talking about like back in the day, we used to, you know, you got done with heavy bench, what did you do? You loaded up the bench, and you did a whole bunch of eccentric negatives. We used to do that with uh, with deadlifts, we did it with squats, but it was always at the end, and I never heard somebody actually fixing it in its own block. Or, hey, I'm just going to do this, but there's also other days. I mean, there, we can dig in more on this um, if you have questions on the program. Okay. Yeah, but you'll share that with them, right? Yes. All right, perfect, thanks. Um, and, and you can be creative. Look, I'm just telling you what I do, and yeah, it's in a, it's in a pretty advanced environment. So um, I, uh, I solve my problems, but I do, some of the best coaches I've seen have solved their own problems, especially even at the high school level, because there's more problems, okay? Like some of the foot stuff we'll get to, my, world, my, my friend uh, Hank Cranoff, uh, he has coached 18 Olympic and World Championship medals. Other elite coaches have three, okay? And, and he's never seen the foot problems I've showed him. Why? Because the elite sprinters won't have them, because you won't be elite if you have them, okay? But who created a majority of the foot things? My friend who coaches high school kids. He's an elite coach, but he coaches high school kids, and he sees these problems. And I, my kids had the problems, but I didn't fix them as well as I could have. So, um, where we're at. Next thing I'm gonna talk about is hip extension. If you can't get this, what's gonna happen? You're gonna die. I'm not kidding you. If you can't extend your hip, how are you gonna move? How are you gonna hunt for water? You can't make babies, we can't reproduce, the whole deal, it's horrible. All right? <laughs> this is the correct hip extension pattern firing. The glute fires then the hamstring, and then the contralateral QL so you don't rotate. If you, I've checked this, EMGs, yes. If, look, if you have that pattern, 
the bar on bench press moves faster. Yes. Got it? So, so people are like, on oh, bench press when you're lying there? Yes. So if I'm going to go push somebody, I'm going to go push what I just do. I use my glutes, I stabilize so I can push them. If I'm going to pull them, what I just do? I use my glutes to stabilize to pull. So every movement. And look, I've checked this pattern on everything from bench press to all my other lifts, thousands of experiments, and the bar moves faster every time. What's the bad pattern? That's the good, that's the correct one. The bad one, a, uh, the correct one, these are the most functional, I'm sorry. Wrong pattern is a hamstring firing. The hamstring fires first, then the contralateral QL, and then the glute. So some of you have this pattern here, when I saw you walk in. I'm not judging you, okay, trust me, I'm not judging you. But you have that pattern. So what happens to those people? The hamstring, they have pulled hamstrings. I found wide stance power lifters have this a lot too. What's it doing? It's causing that hamstring to fire first in hip extension pattern. So, and, and the research will say, because I've had a bunch of scientists come up to me after I've lectured on this, say, hey Cal, I think you're wrong, because the hamstring's actually involved in the hip extension before the glute. I got it. But they analyzed running, and that's fine. Yes, of course the hamstring's on. Because if I landed without my hamstring on, I'd blow my knee out there, big shooters, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about actual hip extension. Once you've stabilized and drive, the first pattern I showed you was optimal. And then they agreed with me, okay? But, and then when you run, let's say you go out and run 400, what's gonna tighten up? Your hamstring, because it's doing hip extension all the time. Right? When you, and then it's driving hip extension. When it's starting hip extension, when you walk, because you overstride a little bit and you use your hamstring to pull you, it becomes tight. And you become, and then what do people do? They stretch it. It tears muscle fibers apart. Sets it up for a hamstring pull, in my opinion. If you get them in the right pattern, guess what happens to the hamstring? It releases and lengthens itself back to normal. Okay? So the other bad pattern, real quick, is a very dangerous one. Your QL. Your QL fires hip extension pattern first, then it fires the hamstring, and then the glute. What happens here? What happens there is they have tight lower back, especially when they go run or do something stupid like that, running, okay? I'm not a big runner. Um, tight back, future disc problems, I'll be honest with you, bracing the core causes this pattern, okay? And I'll show you some things about bracing the core in a little bit. The worst people I've ever seen with this pattern are yoga instructors and Pilates instructors, all right? I'll give you an example. I had an athlete that left me, he was 6'5", he had five fingers between his ribs and hip bones, so you can check yourself. You should actually have four, okay, in my opinion between your top of your hip bone and the bottom rib. You should have four, okay? Now, here's the deal. He leaves me with five, goes to a, a training, a team, professional team, that all they focus on is, is, is core training. Four months later, I saw him skating on the ice, and he had this pattern when he skates. I can identify it. His ribs had came, touched the hip bone, and actually went inside the hip bone. Yep. Guess what happened after I texted him? said, hey, you need some work. I'll send somebody down. He's like, okay. He never got back to me. Two weeks later, he had a blown disc. End of the season. Done. Okay? Now, he had that pattern. Why? In my opinion, the core bracing. Um, can I borrow somebody here real quick? Real quick. Look, I'm just going to do some simple muscle testing. I've checked this on force plates. If you don't know what those are, you stand on them, they're very sensitive, they'll check balance. So stand up here, face everybody. All right, I want you to march in place, just real quick. To me, marching's a great, I'll, I'll cover this, just use your arms too, just march. Marching resets the nervous system, kind of realigns you. All right, relax, I'm gonna muscle test you, ready, hold. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I got a foundation, I want you to brace your core nice and hard, however you wanna do it. Ready, brace it nice and hard, ready, hold. Feel how weak you are? Yep. Why? It's a threatened pattern. Core bracing also causes this hip extension pattern. Now I want you to 
Squeeze your glutes nice and hard. Ready? Feel a difference? Yeah. Squeeze your core. Ready? <laughs> Ready? Ready? Yep. Squeeze your core. <laughs> All right, one finger. All right? That's a threatened state. Okay? I'm telling you. So, how do I, how do I coach everything? I have them squeeze their glutes. From pull-ups to squats, everything. And we'll get into the foot because I want you to squeeze your toe into the ground now okay. and squeeze your glutes nice and hard. Ready? Hold. Oh, you feel a difference? Yeah. That's even better. Ready? Very good. You can check it. I'm telling you, bracing the core is bad feedback. Every exercise I've ever checked, not just this way, but bar speed, everything. Bracing the core. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it if you have a back problem. I'm saying in healthy humans. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hey. Like with the uh, powerlifters who will wear like a kind of a looser belt and then fill the belly up and push against it, um, that is uh, more similar to what we're talking about uh, than you know, like driving your big toe on the ground, you know, like pulling in and drawing in your trunk, opposed yep. to like, like filling the belly from right. there and driving it out. And I think that's good. And I, I th here's here's where my take is, John. If you have the hip firing correctly, working then what happens is the core will brace itself the correct way and they will do it that way, but only when they need to do it. So when they're walking their, thing, or their weight out, if everything's turned on correctly, John, the core will instantly fire exactly how much it needs to to stabilize itself. So what they do by presetting them sometimes is they're, they're, they're putting their body in a threatened state before they do it. Does that make sense? And they don't have the correct hip extension pattern to start with. So yeah, it's not wrong, but quite often people find once they get this all right, then their core will, will turn on instantly because the pattern's correct so that it can stabilize when it needs to. Because some people walk out with 800 pounds, they're like, oh, I didn't need to know. I, I didn't know that I didn't need to stabilize yet. I need to stabilize in the bottom and I'll naturally do that when, it, when it's time. Does that make sense? And some people have to do that because they're just not that strong. Yeah, so what you can do is you can play with it and test it yourself. Because some people need it, in my opinion, they'll need it at different stages, but it has to be done to stabilize at some point. I, 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 yep. I've never been a proponent of that idea. Right. I really always felt that driving the belt and filling full air and pushing out, because uh, I always felt more about drawing in the trunk and being able to kind of, like you said, put the big toe on the ground, squeeze the glute, and draw in the trunk. But the idea of, like, doing that, you know, big breath in, like, you know, it, it, and they may need it. I don't know, but when I've tested it, it doesn't seem to work that well. Yeah, so how do you check that? Um, anybody got, anybody knows this pattern's messed up in them? Huh? You think? Come on up here. Yeah, one of you, e e either or. Yeah. <laughs> so as a coach, I'm gonna show you how to check this patterns. Real quick, it's so simple. Um, do you know anything about RPR or anything? A little, little bit. All right, lay down, however, face down. So what I'll do, it's pretty simple. We'll see if he's on first. So if I lift this athlete up, I'm gonna check his hip pattern. So you're just gonna lift your leg up. Ready, lift your leg up. And then what I do is I'm gonna see if I can push his leg down. You ready, hold. Is that all you got? Ready, lift up. Ready, hold. His glutes, his glutes aren't that bad. They're just not that strong, I'll be honest with you. Okay, scoot over here. Ready, lift up. A little better. Mm. Your, your glutes aren't bad. I'm gonna, can I drive you? Just something different. Um, you got a light QL, but I want a huge difference. Anybody got hamstring problems too? I just wanna, I, you got a problem, I'll show you how to fix it, but. Uh, I got problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want, a, I want a, a, a very different okay, response. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so the first test, lift up, extend your leg up, ready, hold, hold. It's not bad, it should be a lot better. So. He's a hamstring, right? Now, if I go to the correct firing stance, if it's one, two, three, and I go to push, he's rock solid, but he's not. I push him down, boom. And he's not that far off. He's not, he's not ideal, but he's still a hamstring. The reason you curl the leg is to take the hamstring out, right? So if I push down and they drop, guess what? He's a hamstring pattern. Let's see the other side. Ready, lift up, hold. That's a hamstring for sure, you feel it? Yeah. 
Now, the only other pattern is the QL. So if I go to push down, and this shoulder, opposite shoulder raises, it's a QL firing pattern. Got it? Real quick. So if I lift up, if he lifts up, I push, it's rock solid. He's a glute, and he's good. If I push down, and he drops, he's a hamstring. If I push down and the opposite shoulder comes off the table to, to stabilize the hip, he's a QL pattern. Got it? So now you know what your clients are. So then the question is, I'm gonna lead this into the foot thing. Let's see if I can get that pattern to reset. I want you to take your big toe. You have a big toe, right? Yeah. Okay. I want you to curl it nice and hard. I want you to lift this leg up. Ready, go. Ready, Hop. Okay, ready? Do it again. <clears throat> By curling the big toe, cause a Babinski reflex, I just ingrained the right pattern. I fixed his pattern. His patterns were wrong, I just fixed them. Try that one. You don't believe me? <laughs> Curl the toe. Ready? Up. Hold. There. You feel the difference? Oh, yeah. You feel the strength that you have? So, this is why years ago, I got lucky. All my athletes pushed the big toe into the ground to cause the right hip extension pattern. When we squat, we squeeze the ground. When we did plyos, we squeeze the ground. I didn't know for sure. It just looked correct to me, all right? It ingrains the right pattern. So when you teach your athletes to walk, you need them to teach, squeeze your toe in the ground. Because guess what? You can do all the right stuff in the weight room. Let's say we get 200 reps of right everything in the weight room. They walk out there, and they're wearing flip-flops. Flip-flops won't let your toe squeeze in the ground. You have to hold your toe up to keep the flip-flops on when you walk. It's a reverse pattern for the foot, so it shuts this off. Got it? So, let's see, that's just one way. The other way I use is RPR. Have you ever had that done to you? No. All right, um, you mind if I hit you there? Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. If you, if you haven't seen RPR, this is bad, I'm sorry. So, here we go. And all we do, and I could have him fix it, I just, for time's sake, why do I hit the back of the neck and the back of the jaw? All right, I'll explain. Now, I want you to come on up. I don't want, that's bad, isn't it? However, I don't want you to use your toe. I just want you to lift up. Ready, lift. Very good, ready, hold. Okay, you're not using your toe, right? So RPR is a soft tissue reflexive response to various tissues for the hip extension pattern. I just fixed it, right? I just fixed it by hitting those. Now, use your toe. Ready? Go. It's even, it's even stronger. Ready? Up. He might be able to hold you off the table. He's close. So his hip patterns walk. Now, jump up. Walk around. When you walk, I want you to squeeze that toe in the ground. Walk yourself forward. See if you feel anything different. What you do, you need, you need to start using your glutes when you walk. So when you take a walk, you need to take a step, toe grabs the ground, and you push yourself forward with your glute. It's a little awkward at first because he wasn't I doing it. You, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, okay. So now, here's the catch. Here's where I get all the hate email. Guess what? I, ch I, I checked this about 18 months ago. I have somebody and their hamstring drops. Your glute's not on. What do you do for your workout? All these glute activation exercises, right? Guess what happens when you go do all those? You tire out the glute. You make it worse. Check it. I got hate, I released this on YouTube. I got hate, hate email from all over the world. Okay? Saying that, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, you're out. <laughs> so you can do all the glute exercises you want. If you have a bad pattern, and you do glute exercises, it doesn't make anybody better. You may find somebody, but I've checked 100 people, and they all got worse. Everyone got worse. But I can feel my glutes. Why? They're fatigued. That's it. That's the only reason. Okay? So, by, so then people are, well, what if I have a good glute pattern? You got a good glute pattern. Why are you doing glute exercise activation? You don't need to. Look, I, and there's entire books wrote on those. I don't think they've ever checked it.
to be honest with you. There's entire books wrote on core bracing. I don't think they've ever checked it. What are your, what's your core hook to? Right below it. Your hips. If you get the hips working correctly, the core will fire correctly. Okay? How do you get the hips working correctly? Get that hip extension pattern going. I like to, so on my way down, we actually hold our toe up, and then on the way to reverse the movement, we squeeze the toe into the ground, and we get the glutes to fire. You can check it. I've checked tendos, gym awares, everything. Everyone moves the weight faster, harder, more explosively, and they're more reactive, okay? Yes? So, uh, you alluded to this, but our walking pattern to train this outside of the gym should be drive the toe in and pull. Yes. Bury the toes, like I should be burying my toes and squeeze. The, um, here we go. So, you want to re ask it? Yeah, so uh, you alluded to this. Uh, as far as our walking pattern, I'm just thinking about how can we apply this outside of the gym. We want to grab the ground with our big toe and pull through. Yes. Um, and then when we're standing, what position should we be in? If, you know, are we burying our big toe in a light glute activation? It, in my opinion, you should have your toe grasping the ground a little bit. You don't have to be burying into the ground, right? But there should be some activation on it. And you'll be, you just feel, so when I check people with, with balance, if they close their eyes and I take the, the visual system out of balance, and then I, I work on the force plates, if they have some tension in their toe and their glutes are a little bit activated, their balance is way better, okay? And in my opinion, um, what I found is the Babinski reflex is off in a lot of adults. I'm not sure why. If you can get that turned back on, people will use their toe more, but the problem is I think we just wear the wrong shoes or, the, or shoes too much. We walk around on flat surfaces that are the same, and then this reflex gets shut off, and then that's why we're not using. So yes, I coach my athletes, when they take a step, they should be squeezing that toe in the ground, and then it pulls themselves forward with their glutes. That's how they should be walking. The other way, the, the hamstring pattern you'll see, they'll have a slight forward lean, and they'll overstride a little bit, and they'll pull themselves forward with their hamstring. Hamstrings are not made for walking. They're made for running, okay? Um, a lot, and then uh, the other one, the other pattern is you'll see people walk too upright and they look like they got back pain. That's the QL problem. You can see that happen, okay? Yep. Yes. Other questions? Yes, sir. Hi. How you doing? Don't dispute your results and not arguing at all about what's happening. Just wondering, is it at all possible that you're getting the results for different reasoning. What results, I guess? Uh, okay, so you did the patterns. You've given us three different patterns. You've given us a QL pattern, a glute pattern, a hamstring pattern, mm -hmm. sequencing of firing, which in some research has shown not to correlate not, to yep. low back pain. Uh, and I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is correlating to back pain. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering, is it, because I do this demonstration, but I do it with all sorts of stuff, right? Like I do it with words, I do it with smells, I do it with all sorts of stuff. Number one, could it be placebo? Could it be uh, just because it's different and so it's a novel neural stimulus? Again, I'm not disputing mm, yep. the force plate results or anything like that. Um, are there other possible reasons why your, obs your observed results are the way that they are. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's no doubt there could be. I just know how I fix it and get my results. Um, yeah, there could be muscles turned off in different places of the hip. Um, but what I found is that this is the, the most usable thing I currently have to give coaches to help fix these problems. Now, I have athletes doing things that they don't even know why we're doing them. And when we coach this up, or we, we, if they're incorrect, if they have a bad pattern, then we can fix that pattern. They don't even know what we're looking at, so I don't know if it's placebo effect or not. I did do something, but they don't know what I did or what it's gonna cause, and all of a sudden their hamstring you know, is, was overworking, and now it's not working as much, like 20% less, and their glutes 15% more, and they run faster. And that's just all the biological experimenting that I've done. Yes, there's, there's, there's many things that can help that. I mean, I know, I have a lateral sling can be off. Your, your, your arch of your foot, which I'll talk about here in a second, can shut this off. There's no doubt, there's, there's many things. And by squeezing the toe, it might be the arch of the foot that's being supported, 
okay? And then the glutes are turning on correctly with the right pattern because the feedback loop coming through from the ground, because the only thing you walk, the only thing that touches the earth, as John said, is your foot. So it could be a ton of things, but ultimately with EMGs and everything that I've checked, by these coaching points, I've been able to turn people on and things have, have uh, well, high performance and some pain, not all pain will go away, but they're in a better spot anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely, because a lot of the times, because you know, this glute hamstring back thing has been around, I'm a PT, I'm a physical therapist. Yeah, of therapist. course, it's been around, uh, so it's who, been who around started it? Not Comerford or, or there was some other ones out of there. There's, there's a yeah. lot of people out there that Out of the check, it. I believe. And for some of the people that I'm dealing with, because I, I deal with the broken, right? So that's my referral yeah, yeah. bias. Um, sometimes I have to actually teach them a different pattern to the glute hamstring back one that they do have just because it seems different and disassociated from their pain. So I have no doubt so, yeah. for high performance. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I agree with you. You may have to teach something different to get them out of their pain. There's no doubt about that. I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing at all. I'm saying I'm, I'm looking to try to get Olympic champions, and this seems to be the pattern for high performers in my case. I agree. Yeah. And now if it's pain, I'm not in that wheelhouse. Sure, I've gotten rid of some pain, but yeah, it's not my pain. And I, I obviously, I, I defer to PTs. However, you know, my, my one, my big beef with PTs is that they'll say, okay, every PT I seem to meet, everybody's core is weak, <laughs> right? And yet they just gave me that answer on a female that produced 700 newtons of flexion, abflexion, which is stronger than most males. And they sent her back from the PT, said her core's weak. And I was like, okay, I walked him down a path. And then I was like, did you check it? And I sent him how much she did. And, and like, this is every PT in the country, and I'm just going, I, I don't believe any of it. You guys don't even know, because you don't even test anything. But all of us, I'm right, right, and you're probably different because you're here, right, <laughs> obviously. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, and then they want to brace the core, and I show them how bad the core, how, how bad the motor pattern is with the core bracing. And I'm not saying there's not a time to do core bracing. I'm just saying it doesn't work in high performers. Would you have your, your guy run a 40 yard dash with your core braced? Do you ever, has anybody ever done it? Has any PT ever done that? Has any strength coach ever done it? I sat there and they lose three tenths off their 40. So why would we have them do it in the gym? Yeah, I mean, that's my big thing, so, yes. Thanks, hey, I just wanted to say, I appreciate the kind of uh, reference to the uh, EMG studies, and I think where that core, weak core has come from is there's an EMG study years ago that talked about low back pain, and yes. when does transverse abdominis... Uh, with back injured people. Yeah, with yeah. back injured people fire, and when does it not, mm -hmm. and they show the one with, yep. with pain, it's, it's second to the deltoid yep. versus normal person's first right. in the deltoid. So. Uh, I think it gets lost as in the rehab world. I'm a PT also in, in the yep. strength conditioning world of, yeah, we got to get this core strong. But, right. but if we're not injured and we don't have pain, then that's not the first thing we need. I know. Yeah. And lifting heavy weights, in my opinion, is the best way, right? I mean, my athletes will do 120% of load. And when they get a DEXA scan, we have like the highest lean muscle mass in the midsection. Because why? I don't do core training. Oh, I do, but, but I have females doing single leg squats with 360 pounds that weigh 140. So their core gets really thick, but I don't, need, I don't do core training. Because in, in the DEXA scan, which is a gold standard, so it says that we have all this, this muscle. Now, um, I think with, with this pattern, so here's the big thing with that pattern. I'll use the one example. My, my five fingers between the ribs, and they developed the wrong pattern by bracing the core. And everybody that braces the core, in my opinion, when you check, that rib gets pulled down. Because they'll be with me at four, and they leave me, and then they go to zero, one, or negative two fingers. And that's, I'm, how did that happen? What was the reason for that? I just can't see the patterns. I don't get any good feedback. Brace the core, do your exercise. I mean, there's a lot of things, right? Um, but anyway, we'll get to the foot. Uh, other questions, yes? Uh, real quick, just taking it back to the foot, how you talked about driving the toe on the ground. So you always, I've heard it a couple times, you say lift the toes up in your squat. Is there a specific reason during the eccentric of that movement you're lifting your toes, or is that, can you dive into that a little bit? I'm, yeah, I'm training the, so on the way down, I'm training the extensor arch, and we lift our toe up, okay? And then on, when you go to reverse, 
the toe hits the ground and will shorten and you train the flexor arch, okay? So the reason you're doing that is because if on the way down, if that arch collapses, what happens is you get the, the, the knee will go valgus, right? And a lot of people think it's a glute med. Well, the glute med shut off, but in my experience now, I'm roughly up to 80 to 90% of the time saying it's a foot problem. And it's a lateral sling arch problem, okay? Um, I, I can find the difference. Um, I don't know, I didn't see, can I see? I think maybe you do. Jump up here real quick. Can you jump on my table real quick? On your back, head down there, on your back. Flip over, flip, black, back, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. So, how I check the lateral sling, I'll just hold this leg out, and he's gonna hold it right there in that position, I'm gonna pull it in. Whoop, don't, ah, he's not bad. He's shocking better than I thought. Ready, hold. This one's a little weaker, did you feel it? Yeah. So, I can turn his hips on. What I'll do, and this is the one spot that I found, is if this arch collapses, the brain goes, I don't have stability. Where can I find stability? It goes to the knee, you can't find it. It'll actually turn certain muscles, overuse muscles in the hip and other ones shut down. The only thing touching the ground when you run is your foot. So, with that being said, I'll see if he's got a foot problem. So, I just reach on the inside of the calf, through the midline and right by the head of the tibia, and I'll just rub, you feel that? It's probably not very fun, is it? Nope. Okay, and it's really intense. And I've found that if I hit that area, and if their arch collapses when they run, this can help for a while. That spot right there. Which then, if he's, hey, he hasn't even ran yet, and now we'll see if the brain knows that the foot's in a good spot, and see if it turns his hip muscles back on. Hold that leg out, ready, hold. <clears throat> you feel the difference? Yeah. So, he has a foot problem and not a hip problem. Okay, so if he was squatting and his hip was shifting, you could have him hit that arch on the inside and it would stop shifting. Now, is it possible? I don't know. I've had, him, I've had people hit other spots and it doesn't turn them on and they still shift. So I just hit this inside of this calf because he's got a foot problem. I'll do the other one for him so he's not... Do you have any uh, foot problems in the past that you... Uh, I've got... Arthritic knee on this side. Okay. No okay. His foot was weak. That's what's shutting his hips off. So his ability to, ready? Hold. Feel the difference? Obviously. Now, here's another thing with that arch. I was at US, uh, the national team camp. Had over 100 girls, six girls with groins. And they came to me, middle of the camp, like, hey, and I'm the strength coach. I got to do something, maybe. I checked the uh, adductors, and how I'll do that is just internally rotate the leg, you hold the leg in, I'm gonna pull out, ready? And his are on now. Here's why, they were on. Here's why they're on. These girls with a groin problem, I actually just found that that was shut off. I actually hit this arch reset, turned it back on, they went out and skated, and that practice, the groin problem went away. But if you look at the tissue and the, train, the line, if this collapses and all this tissue gets tight, it runs right up there. So the foot is connected all over the place. It's the only thing touching the ground. If you have bad feedback and weak feet, you're going to have some bad feedback all the way up the chain. And look, I see all these problems and I can fix them really quick. Are they permanent? Sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes for a few hours and they're back off. Okay. I'm just telling you, these are my examples. I'm going to get to the foot thing right now, the five best foot exercises I got that fix the most. And look, it's not going to fix it every case. I'm done. Thank, thank you, Lewis. It's not going to fix every case, but it's going to fix this summer, pigeon toedness. Can, can you give me a reason why it happens? I mean, I think there's multiple since you're PT. I mean, how about you? I mean, there's multiple reasons probably, isn't there? for pigeon toedness, right? One of the reasons I found is that one of the, if this arch is weak, the body will find a different arch. So it internally rotates the foot and rolls to a stronger arch in the foot. If I can get that stronger arch, I had three kids that it changed their gait. And they'd been in my system for two years. And this actually helped. And I'm gonna, I'll show you those real quick. Um, 
I'm going to bring those slides up. Okay. Like I said, I would be all over the place. So, as I said, isometrics, there's five, there's five foot, there's two foot positions, and there's three different positions for the knee in these. So, and, and here's my one big beef. I don't want to pick on PT since there's two here. I'm sorry. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're probably, you guys aren't normal because you're here. So we'll just leave that. People say, I, I release these foot things, and they're like, oh, what about, what about a foot strengthening exercise where the, the towel, you know, you put the towel on, you kind of curl it in. And I'm like, oh, the foot. If, John, how fat are you, John? Where's John Wilborn at? <laughs> right, what, what's your body weight? You were, when you were at your fattest, it was 320, right? Uh, yeah, no, no. He, we'll just say he's, he was north of 300 pounds when he was at his fattest. Uh, uh, like, the heaviest they to Jeez. All right, pork chop. Um, so my point is, when and you were pretty fast, you could move that fat a lot, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. So let's say John was really fast. When he pushed his foot in the ground, how many thousands of pounds of, I think there was probably over a thousand pounds or we were close to a thousand pounds of force with that foot. You see what I'm saying? Do you think that little towel exercise of squeezing is gonna really get John ready to run on a foot when he's got 300, 26 pounds of, of muscle, a little bit of fat, right? A little bit. <laughs> All right. I don't believe you. You got a picture? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got a picture. I don't believe you. You got a picture? No, I don't. Um, I saw some pictures. Now, my point is, is they don't have enough stress with some of these exercises. So some of the best exercises I've seen and they're finding out with isometrics that they can help with the brain, rewiring a little bit to improve the function. I created five isometric, we created five isometric, two foot positions, really. It's two foot positions, three side positions, but it's an isometric. And here, what we have is the, the thigh positions, you basically do these, these foot positions in a deep squat, a mid-level squat, and a straight leg. And the foot position is basically stretched on the edge of a plate or wherever you want to be or in the, the highest level. So these are basically the end ranges of the foot. So it's the beginning of the movement and at the end. And then I'll do it with a toe curl. So I'll play this video. So here's how we get into it. So this is spring ankle one. So he gets in there, he gets in the position with two. I'll get out of your way. And then he extends his foot as far down as he can. He gets into the deep squat position and then he removes it. And he'll hold that for 60 seconds. But where love, the highest level is at is I have 130 pound females in that position, deep squat, and I'm, I have 250 pounds pushing on them as hard as I can and they'll hold it for 10 seconds. You see the difference? That foot position exercise of the stress that's going on versus like a calf raise well, doesn't hit the end range like this. Now, the next one is the same position, but with the high foot. So it's the same position for the knee, so it's a deep squat. And then you'll see him lift his, watch, his, he lifts his toes up as high as he can, and then he takes it out. And he's pushing, and, and then that's 60 seconds. And then we'll do it for 30 with weight. And then eventually, once we get to the 10 second loading model, is where you're in all five of these positions, and you're, I'm pushing violently. My athletes are pushing violently on that. Okay? And what we've seen is crazy changes in foot, running gait. Kids flare their knees out. People flaring their arms out when they run. Where does it stem from? A lot of it can stem from the foot. I've seen the foot strike the ground incorrectly, have weak feet, shuts the lateral sling off. Why does the arm swing out when you run? The, lateral, the, lateral, the, the body needs to stabilize itself. So it's because there's no stability here, the body swings the arm out. I turn the arch on, or the hip, whatever the needs, and the arm comes in without coaching them. 
So they're running like this, or running like this. You fix the foot, like that arch reset I just did, and the arm actually swings back in. So I try to coach people into movements without coaching them. I try to find out what's the problem. So is that a placebo effect? Maybe. But I can get that kid to run without telling him to coach. Because you got a world-class kid, and I've, I've done this for coaches that come see me. I'm not a track coach. They bring their people over to, to have me work with them, and the coach, and he's running with his arms out. He's like, oh, i got to teach that guy to run with his arm. See his right arm, he's got to hold it in. So you're telling me you got a world-class athlete. You're going to say, run down the track as fast you can and hold your left arm in. You can't do that. But if you can get that athlete, okay, to get the lateral sling on or the arch, then that arm comes in without coaching, and he only has to think, run down the track as fast as I possibly can. Um, the next exercise is, it's really the same as the ones you did. The deep ankle, it's just a higher squat. So those are exercise three. So he's just in a higher squat position this time. And he's trying to get his calf as deep as he can. It's at the bottom range, and you want to have tension. You don't want him to relax. And they're pushing down into the ground. And then he'll do the high calf position. So there's a two foot positions, deep squat, high deep squat of the ankle, mid squat, high squat of the ankle on the, uh, the mid squat. And then the last one, and, and look, here's the deal. The last one is a straight legged high foot because you'll never be straight-legged with the foot at the bottom. Does that make sense? Now, and you'll find people struggle with this. People struggle with this. Why? Their foot's not strong, and they haven't applied enough stress. This solves so many foot pro or problems that I've seen with the foot. Just these five. I'm not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but these are the five best that we've come up with using isometrics. What I'll do... Um, Who's in charge? Is somebody in charge here? Would it be Tex or Luke? Are they here? No. Hey, um, I'm, I want all these guys to have that my spring ankle manual, so you guys can pay me for it. And I'll, no, I'll give it. I'm teasing. I'll give everybody here one. All right. However many codes. So I got a book, a complete book on all this. You don't have to take worry about it. I'll send it to these guys. Will you get them the codes, Luke? You'll get them the codes. Perfect. Yeah, and then I got a peaking manual that we'll do too. How much time do I have yet? It's not enough, brother. Um, <laughs> um, so, and then the, the I, I would like to show you guys the way I would like teach a sports specific squat, maybe, how I do it. It's a lot different. Yes? Okay, yes. And it's in the manual. So he want, you want me to clarify the, the toe curl part? So you, all, all those positions with toe flat and also toe curl. Yep. And then are you putting something under the toe? Yeah, I did in one of these videos, I think. Um, I just, you know what I did? I did, yeah, right here. I just put a little piece of, uh, I, I took like a gym floor and I, I cut a dowel in half because I, I found my athletes were struggling to hold that short foot position with the toe. So I just cut a dowel, I, I glued it to, yeah, like a one inch dowel, glued it, I cut it in half and then glued it to the mat, and then I put that in there when they were curling their toe. Does that make sense? And that's where I found them. Now look, so if this is the arch of the foot, if this is the heel, the arch goes up, and we're going down to the toe, plantar fasciitis, what happens is this arch collapses upon impact, and then the toe and this reshortens and comes back up. With that collapse, because you're not strong, okay, all the tissue down there gets stretched and then you have to reshorten it to run. I found that's the case. That's what's happening in a lot of my plantar fasciitis athletes. So if you can make them strong and they don't collapse upon impact, if they have an extensor arch, and a strong flexor arch, then they're less likely to get plantar fasciitis. Because people look at my stuff and like, how much, you do a lot of jumping, a lot of things. I'm like, yeah, but I don't get any of that problem, okay? I, this is the people I've seen, this happens to them when they come and they have this problem, okay? And 
my opinion, they're just not strong enough to hold that. Now, the other, the other aspect of my training, uh, I don't know if I can draw it, I may need to show you, but if this is the ball of foot and this is the toe, when we squat down, we are lifting our toes up. Okay, on the way down, when my athletes squat down, they're lifting their toes up. I don't squat on the balls of my feet. I don't squat on my heels. I've never squatted on my heels for 20 years. I know that's what a lot of power lifters think. And look, it's great for power lifting, but I got a whole team of women that will beat every thousand pound squatter in a 20 yard dash that I've seen, right? If you want to roll out a thousand pound squatter and see if you can be, I would say at least the power lifting squatters, maybe not the Olympic lifters, okay? Because they look a little bit more athletic. But, and, my, and, she, and she doesn't want to squat more than 225 on her back. She can beat you in a 20 yard dash and you squat 1,000, right? And they can't run either, so um, they walk like this. You know what I'm saying, you've seen them. Um, they're not very athletic. And I love power lifting, I love watching it, it's really good. Um, so let me um, show you how I coach I'll just use, I'm gonna use this as an example, or uh, I wish I had a little stage here, but so for example, we'll do a safety bar uh, squat, and I'll use, when I'm heavy squatting, I use, we hold on to stuff, so I'll use a safety bar squat, and the reason is, I'm not trying to do anything but get maximal loading basically, usually. I'm not worried about stability, right? So uh, I think I have, well, I, I, actually I have the PowerPoint here, I'll show you. Um, may have to switch from the PowerPoint. Switch around. Um, might be the other one. It is the other one. That's right. Here. right here um yeah let's go there so for last so look if you can see those there's a power lifting squat really good on the right i've never seen one of my athletes in that position on the field ever ever never ever i've been waiting for 20 years that's how i squat the foot's exaggerated Okay, the foot's exaggerated, why? Because I want to make sure I squat with the heels off the ground. I had a coach fly from uh, another country, Ireland. He didn't believe me. We walked in and all my athletes, we do step ups, we do lunges, everything is with your heel off the ground. Why? You play sports with your heel off the ground. The only animal, I used to say, the only animal in the world that runs with their heel is an elephant. But that's actually incorrect, because an elephant person got a hold of me after they heard me say that, <laughs> and said, elephants run, their fat pads touching the ground, but not the bone. So they actually run on their toes too, <laughs> all right? So I've always been wrong, ask my wife, like, it's, there's always times where I'm wrong. And which one looks more athletic? Obviously. This one over here, if I went up and hit that guy in the head just like this, what would happen? He'd probably fall over, right? This one over here is what happens in acceleration. This is what happens in all my sporting movements. This is the right pattern. They squeeze their toe in the ground violently, and they extend. So yeah, I'm just telling you. And then you squat like this with your eyes closed. I check your balance. I check force plates. I check muscle testing. I check the feedback. Guess what? This one's good. The other one, not so good. It's not so good. That's just your feed, body giving you feedback. I switched, so, and then people say, well, what do you do? Do you not like heavy squats? Love them. But this is why I use the safety bar split squat. And look, I coach that knee to go over the toe. I actually want that to go over the toe as far as I can when we squat. 
When I say squats, I mean single leg squats. I mean lunges. When I do a step up, um, can I borrow that chair? So when you watch me do a step up, like here's a normal step up, ready? A bodybuilding step up, I'm holding weight. I'll pull myself forward. what I just do? I just fired my hamstring to pull my hips forward. Here's how my athletes do it. Heel off the ground, we'll drive straight into the ground. That's, that's the pattern we use. Squeeze the toe, we'll drive straight into the ground. Bodybuilding, same thing with lunges. I won't muscle test, but if you do lunges like this and then you pull yourself forward, you're, you're using your hamstring to pull yourself forward. What we'll do is we'll go in, load up the foot here, heels off the ground, and I drive straight up. Squeeze your toe, drive straight up. And then you can do 10 of those with your eyes closed, check your balance on force plates. The way I suggest, your balance is in the 90 percentile. The way the other way, your balance is in the 70, 60 percentile, every time. Or you can muscle test them, however you want to do it. I'm just telling you, and then we load the knee in front of the toe, and people say, oh, what about your knee pain? I don't have knee pain, okay? This is the right problem. If you have that hamstring problem, so uh, you can just do an experiment. Find some of your gym that's got knee pain when they squat. Have them squat. If you just maybe put a band on their knee and have, pull forward when they squat, the, the, the tension, the new tension and the new pattern may take the knee pain away, right? But if they have the right pattern, in my opinion, most of the time, you won't have that knee pain. Not always. It's not always the case. There's no absolutes. But my point is, so do I like heavy weights? Yeah, because my athletes, I'll have a 180-pound hockey player do 600-pound single-leg safety bar squat. It'll cause a huge hormone release. I've just seen the blood work. I've, I've seen various tests. It causes a large amount. Why, what was it? I didn't even know it would. Co players come to me like, Coach, I don't know what we're doing, but man, when I wake up in the morning... Uh, yep, I got that. Yep, I'm all, I'm, I got that male. I'm, a, I'm all male. Like, I don't know what you're doing, right? Because of the heavy load. Well, marathoners train, why don't, they, why don't they get big and bulky? They just don't have the hormone response that short sprinters do, right? It's that simple. We've got to train for hormones. Using 120% load with triphasic, heavy eccentrics, causes large amounts of stress, and you get greater adaptations. So how I coach it, uh, all my jumps, my athletes will jump straight up and down off their heels when you do plyometrics, okay? The bilateral stuff, I'll be honest with you, when I say bilateral squats, gets a negative feedback. So I've shifted everything I can to this, staggered stance, okay? Staggered stance. So now, if you still gotta do bilateral, I pull somebody off the back squat, their balance is bad. I pull somebody, I have them back squat, or I have them do hurdle hops, same thing. The feedback is not as positive. So then what do I do to reset the nervous system? I did it with Jeremy, right? I just have a march. So my athletes will go through a hurdle hop, they land, they do a double leg exercise. When they get out, they need to get four marches in. They'll just march out of the exercise, four reps, and it resets the nervous system and their balance is back to normal. The feedback loop's good. But every jump that I try to do, everything we do, whether it's uh, like the accelerated bands, we're doing split squats. We can alternate them or you don't have to. It's just a better feedback loop, okay? So everything I do, and I'm, I'm gonna produce a neurological manual here probably in the next four months on this. I have a, a ton of those things that we do. But yes, bilateral movements, I'm not a big fan of them. I think there's good qualities, but I think I can hack it, why? because I do that single leg safety bar squat with the same load that gets me the hormonal responses that I need. And we do it on our toes. People will watch, you know, and I know there's, there's national organizations who, who recommend you to push your butt back and, and all that and land in this position. I've never seen an athlete jump from that position that can jump high. What do they do? They shift themselves forward so then they can jump normal. Okay? Everything I, look, I question everything, even myself, because I've, I've done it all wrong. Well, I, I'll say I've done it all less than optimal, in my opinion. I've gotten better ways and better results with different things. So hopefully with that in mind, you can just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole different concept because people have taught and swear, world champion power, they say you gotta squat like this, but that's not how my athletes move. They've never seen them move like that.
I know it's a lot to take in, but um, look at this. Guy on the left, Barry Sanders. Look at that ankle. If that foot, if that arch collapsed, guess what happens? His hips come up and he can't run as low as he could. Okay? If the inside of his foot, touching the ground, collapsed, if that arch went like this, the knee comes this way, the knee would shift back up, the hips would get higher. So, alignment. People think they got bad hips, they can't play low. 95% of the time, it's they got bad feet. The feet are bad. The brain says, I'm unstable. I won't let you play in a compromised position. So instead of, here, here, I'm going to give you this. I have about 30 of these secrets tied to this one thing. When there's a problem, stop thinking weakness. Start thinking protective mechanism of the organism. So when I say that, so here's one. So I have an athlete running high velocities, and I say high velocities because high velocities are different than low velocities. When you're squatting weight, you may see something, and then when you're running at top end speed, you may see something. So when I have an athlete running, strike, foot striking the ground, the knee internally rotates, okay, at high speed. You have to catch it on film, most cases. What's everybody think that is in the world? They think it's a weak glute med, right? Here's the problem. I get the person on the table, I start checking things out. The glute med's strong. What was weak? The groin. The knee, the brain shifted the knee in to protect the groin at high velocity running so it didn't tear itself apart. So the brain doesn't think about the weaknesses necessarily, it's protecting bad tissues that can be broken when you're doing that motor task. So, what I do, I reset the arch, and lo and behold, the knee didn't internally rotate. I turned the, glute, the groin on by resetting the arch. So stop thinking about weaknesses, and in my opinion, survival pyramid of the organism, you need to think about protective mechanisms. And then doing something a lot of times because it protects tissue somewhere else. Got it? Now, I found 30 of those around the body. I'm not, I'm not going to share those yet. All right? <laughs> okay? And, and look, I'm only a coach. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a PT. But you know what? Doctors have a hard time hearing this because it's not in research. But, like, Doc, if you, you, you do something and, and you create something, it's going to take you 15 years on the average to get it from practice, from, from finding it to bedside practice. Like, I don't have 15 years of losing to figure it out. Right? It's hard. I mean, there's a bunch of things, especially with, with uh, obviously I'm an owner of RPR, full disclosure, but I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff working on somebody's tissue. I'm sure the PTs have here, and a seatbelt mark appears across there because I'm working on a hip that, let's say they broke. And it wasn't me, actually. Working on a hip, somebody, and a, and, a, and a red mark came across. Found out that they broke their hip in a car accident. They had a severe seatbelt mark black and blue, and 10 years later, the seatbelt mark reappeared on the female. And you show that to a doctor, and he has, I mean, it's empirical evidence, it's right there. Bright red mark that appeared 10 years later where the seatbelt mark was. Can you explain that to me? No, they get uncomfortable, most of them, right? But look, I don't know a lot, I'm just a coach. But what I do know is that I can fix people or make them better to perform, and that's my only objective right there. Does that make sense? Good. Um, World-class sprinters, knee in front of the toe. I do everything knee in front of the toe. Everything. Every hip extension pattern is knee in front of the toe. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, your question is, the ho my hockey players do it? Yes, they're in a boot. They need it more than everybody. When I started doing the foot stuff, I thought, that it, here's how important it is. I thought that it wouldn't matter for hockey players because they're in a solid boot. But the coaches came to me and said, I don't know what you do. You're squatting them more or doing something different because they're skating lower. Why? Because even in the boot, if the ankle and the foot is, is firm, then their, their brain will allow them to get deeper into the squat because it feels safe. I didn't think that would happen. I didn't even notice it. The coaches told me. They saw it in practice. Yes, so yes. 
Other questions? I can re repeat the question. Uh, how would you load the push press with the foot? The push press. I would do the same thing. I would experiment. You, I would say get the finer coaching points. I want you to play with it yourself. Now, I would, here's the other deal. I would say you might have to consider some different coaching points with bigger feet. Like you get a, well, the 270 pound athlete that jumped 44 inches, he had 14s and he had strong feet and they were, look, also then, so what I'm saying is you, you're probably gonna have to coach him differently based upon, and then there's leg length, there's torso length, like it's all gonna be a little bit different, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I'll leave you with one thing. Every one of my athletes that have big, large glutes, they also have super strong feet. So my freaky athletes, big old butts, big strong glutes, none of them have small weak feet. No, no, you can have small feet, but they're not weak, right? They break their foot, what happens to that glute on that side? It goes, it gets smaller. So your feet are direct correlations, in my opinion, to, to the glute hip extension pattern. And right there's an example of it. And there's a million ways that the body compensates. I'm not gonna tell you there is. But every one of my athletes, you get them on the table, if you've got a freak of an athlete, and I look at their feet, and you feel them, and they're just thick and strong. They don't have to be long, but they're thick and they're strong. I even have a few that had like smaller bone structures, but when you muscle tested or, or strength, they were just, I mean, it felt like she was gonna break my hand. It was a female, it feels like big strong glutes always on, boom. Feel like she could, when she went like that, it feel like she could have broke my, my hand, uh, fingers if they, were, if they were off to the side or something. So there's a huge, huge component. They're tied together in my opinion. That's just my experience of 20 years trying to fix people. I take from PTs, I take from chiros, I take from everybody, okay? Any other, next question. I'll repeat it, yeah. With core bracing, um, when it comes down to it, I, I work with a few teens and they, they just move like shit because they have this crazy interior pelvic tilt. Or just, you know, how do you, I guess, find the middle ground between bracing your core and making sure we're neutral line and not out of whack? Like, how do I tell a teenager, hey man, pull it down without him overbearing down and squeezing everything out of place? Like you're saying, like, how do you, is it just come down to basically his glutes and all kind of come in? Oh, and so how do I get them more neutral with, yeah. if they're, so yeah. Athletes, you can yeah, yeah, that's a tough one, right? Um, the right pattern, in my opinion, will help in that old case, but yet, what, you know, ultimately, you still don't know if they're going to have the right pattern or not. I mean, it can be day to day, right? Whether, look, that, that pattern goes away if, if one of my girls breaks up with a boyfriend because of due to stress. Um, so to answer your question, it, it, that's always a tough one. Are they compensating for a reason? Is there something tight in there that you don't know about yet? You know, that's the big one, in my opinion, because there seems to be usually a muscle that's, that's uh, that, uh, a compensation pattern that's holding them into that position for whatever reason. So, but again, it, I found, foundationally, I start with breathing. Breathing diaphragms tied to the psoas. It, it could be a number of things. So um, you'll have to start digging in and, and unpeeling that layers of the, the, the hips, in my opinion. I would start at the hips, okay? I could get them on a table, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I do. Yes, sir. To, to address one of the questions previously, what do you, what do you think about like forced eccentrics in the French contrast as opposed to like, if you don't have partners to assist you with a heavy eccentric, could you substitute with just a forced eccentric? Yeah, I, you can use any method in, in my opinion. I like the heavy eccentrics because if it's not heavy, then it, remember that actinomyosin head, it won't tear those fibers apart as well. So I'm trying to get the most response in a two week window that I can, yeah. Um, and then uh, the French contrast, if you want to look it up, I think I made the French contrast better. I didn't make the French contrast. It was Giles Cometti. If you look up Warner Gunther, the world-class shot putter, I mean, he's doing, he's doing French contrast. I didn't invent that, right? If it was me, it'd be German contrast, right? I'm a German. Um, but I did modify it to make it better. It's called potentiation clusters. I'm, I'm just talking, maybe I, it's some of the best stuff I've ever, training method, you've used it, and you agree with me, it's some, if you do, so it's really a, a set of four back squat or whatever you want to do, four, two, four hurdle hops, four loaded jumps with maybe 20 kilos, and then four different jumps or hurdle hops again. All I did with potentiation clusters, we'll do one back squat, one hurdle hop, one loaded jump, one uh, jump accelerated, and we go through and do each that four times. So instead of doing a set of four, 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 and that's your set, 
I'll do one, 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 back to back squat, one, 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 back. We'll do it 16 times, and that's one set. So we do the same amount of reps, we're just doing clusters. Why? Guess what it does? There's, there's two things that I make things better. I apply a lot of stress or I improve the quality. And by cluster training, I improve the quality. So instead of doing four, 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 which is world-class results, I was able to get better results by doing one, 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 one all across the board. And it looks like a freaking circus in your gym, right? Because everybody's just doing one single coming back. But it's, it's awesome. It's as good. And I wrote articles. Just If you research potentiation clusters, you'll see it in my manuals too. Okay? Other questions? Yes? Yeah, I think barefoot's always the way to go, in my opinion. Um, these exercises, like, I would start with these exercises, though. Some friends of mine, um, he had an eight-year-old eight female, um, a daughter that, he, that wasn't that coordinated. But when I looked at her feet, they were, they were so weak and so poor. He did it all summer. He started at 10 seconds. He went up to a minute. Then she added weight, and he swore she got more coordinated. I, now, I have not seen her since. But think about it. If every time she hits the ground and she collapses and there's a bad feedback loop, She's not developing all her motor skills, in my opinion. And those exercises, I would start those with any age group at any time. Okay? They're safe. Just start at 10, 20 seconds in those extreme positions. And it's, it's, they're, it's crazy. And again, I didn't invent those. I knew the problems. My uh, co-author, Chris, on the manual, he, he invented it. He's a high school coach. Well, that's what he says. But I go visit him. He's got a Chicago Bear and an Olympic silver medalist running down his driveway, right? But he's... He says, well, I'm just a high school coach, right? I haven't got it. Yeah. All right, buddy. So uh, he's my friend. I, I love him to death. So um, other questions? Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but right? so in terms of the Shark Bay and stuff, like should I take a program, a few programs, and just apply it in that program? So, yeah. you know, let's say, like, you're talking about, for example, first two weeks, three sets, three sets, yep. three sets, three sets, three sets. Yep. Yep. Just to repeat the question, um, you can essentially take, in my opinion, any concept. I've seen hit people who only use machines apply triphasic in their program with that. So that's why I think I, I've gotten it so much out there is because you don't change your program because your program is for who you need and what you need to do. It's just a very... Now look, look, and, and one big thing, and I would recommend the book. Hey, I'll send the book too. It'll be a digital version, but I'll send the book, okay? Look, if you're going to do triphasic and you got to meet do triphasic six weeks out, okay? Do triphasic 12 weeks out. Do your normal program the next six weeks. You don't want to do triphasic and, and go to a powerlifting meet or something. You need to develop all these qualities and let them develop up in the motor skill and the whole process and the brain comprehend the new body you got. Let six weeks of that to develop. And then, so I, if you're going to do triphasic, start at 12 weeks out, do triphasic, and then do your six weeks normal before an event. Okay, that's where you get world class optimal results. Do you have a? Yeah, could you elaborate on that four finger? Like, I mean, to me, I've got two in between that hip. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I do. I want four fingers in between there. So that top hip bone in there, I, I just take these four fingers and just see what's the gap in there. Um, you can work on that. But there's a reason that's happening. Usually, and look, I'm no kidding, I've had people work on their glute pattern. And that got better just by, just by getting the right extension pattern because they were the QL pattern. So that four finger gap, in my opinion, is good. Now, there's times where I'm really stressed and haven't done the right stuff and I'm three, right? But I think right now, on, actually on this side, I'm, I'm three, this side I'm four. Right now, if I check, but I know I, I'm, I'm a little locked up on this side. I got a QL that I need to get to a Cairo or a um, SI joint. So um, I can't release it myself. I wish I was a Cairo, but I'm not. So. Uh-huh. Can you? Yeah. Oh, I'm here afterwards. I'll pay you. So <laughs> I got some ways, but uh, so you can get it to release without just myself. In the if I'm in the woods, I can get it to release. Yeah. Awesome. We're in. <laughs> I'll pay you. <laughs> I'm all about that. That's awesome. All right. Any other questions before I? Hey, am I I'm hanging this up, right? What do we got? Hey, one more question. One more question. All right. We're on. We're on tack here. Yes, sir. Would be 
Um, it's based on like where you're at with your program. It could be right. Um, I'm I'm releasing a GPP manual where it's basically an entire aerobic block for two to three weeks. Um, I'll send that to when it's done. It might be done next week, two weeks. Okay, uh, I'll send that to you guys. Uh, so I wouldn't just walk in. I wouldn't just walk in to start eccentric heavy. Like God, no. You know what I mean? No matter who you are. So I usually spend two to two to four weeks at minimum getting ready, and I hit that heavy eccentric phase. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now look, there's there's high school and junior high coaches that have said I use eccentric or triphasic, and they go, oh. and I'm like, oh god, don't don't do that, right? But they use lightweight. It just taught the kids to. They th thought it taught them better because they're learning a, a motor pattern. They learn it nice and slow, and then they go down. They learn it nice and slow, and they hold the position. And they thought it just taught the squat a little bit more. I'm like, okay, that made me feel better. Right? I, just don't do it. Like, do not use it with junior high kids. I used it with my 13 year old and 12. He was 12 actually when we started it. It was pretty heavy actually, and it got pretty good results. So whatever, right? But just know your audience, and it was one kid. And I wasn't going to get sued if I screwed him up. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was not going to. But his feet were really strong, and he was ready to go. And he'd been, he'd been preparing for it for, you know, since birth. Yeah, yeah, his whole life. Yeah, I mean, that poor kid. I mean, I omega waved him. Yeah, I've omega waved him. I've done everything. He's, yeah, he's, he is what he is. So, All right. Any more questions? I think we got a mic. We're good? Check, check. Thank you. Uh, so Can I say thanks? Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. I'll be here all day, too.